Hi there, everyone. My name is Priyag Jithani. I'm actually a second year resident at Stanford. And today I wanted to create a video that's very important uh, for both medical students as well as any per, anyone doing residency anywhere. And it's about blood cultures. This is very important because oftentimes when patients come in and they're very sick, we quite literally culture their blood to see if they're growing bacteria. And there's some fundamentals of blood cultures that almost everyone should know, but it, particularly individuals who are in medicine, uh, internal medicine, and even medical students, uh, understanding the foundation of blood culture is very important. So that's what this video is about. So what are blood cultures? The reason for getting blood cultures is ultimately to look for bacteremia. Uh, bacter refers to bacteria, and then emia means in the blood. So you're looking for bacteria growing in the blood. And why is this important? Well, whenever you have bacteria growing in the blood, it's clearly a sign of worsened prognosis. That obviously means that potentially you may be more sick than we might have thought. You need to have specific types of antibiotic therapy. And ultimately, believe it or not, it actually impacts your mortality. You can see here that individuals who have uh, bacteremia clearly have some level of increased cumulative mortality. So there's a really incredible paper that I'm going to link in the description below, but you'll see that sometimes getting blood cultures and seeing if there's evidence of bacteremia is a good thing and definitely indicated, but there are times when you definitely should not get blood cultures because um, one, it's probably not going to change your management, and two, oftentimes, sometimes you can even do a little bit more harm. So for that reason, I want to go over the nuance of when to get blood cultures and ultimately when not to. The prevalence of bacteremia is actually um, dependent on the condition you have. So for example, if you're seeing someone in an outpatient setting, so let's say you're seeing patients in a primary care clinic, maybe you're seeing someone for their routine physical, the chances of you getting blood cultures on them should be really, really low because the chances of them even being infected is much lower to begin with. On the other hand, if someone is sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, that changes your pretest probability because, believe it or not, uh, people who are admitted to the hospital are usually much sicker than people you might see in an outpatient setting. So people who um, uh, have low pretest probability include people with uh, outpatient appointments, for example. Patients with cellulitis also have a very low likelihood of actually having bacteremia because cellulitis is a skin infection and the chance of it actually getting to your blood is much lower. And then ultimately, uh, community-acquired pneumonia, which is usually um, cough, increased sputum production. Uh, community-acquired means that you usually got it outside of the hospital and chances of that leading to sepsis is very, very low. Um, the probability of bacteremia with other types of infections is a little bit higher. So for example, pyelonephritis, which is usually a kidney infection, ultimately leading to nausea, vomiting, and sometimes even costovertebral ankle ten tenderness, um, the chances of that having bacteremia is a little bit higher. And so there, if someone's coming in with an elevated white count, they have a fever, chances of you getting blood cultures for that would probably be a good idea. And so all of this comes into understanding the importance of sepsis, right? Sepsis means um, you have bacteria in your blood, ultimately leading to uh, pronounced vasodilation, ultimately potentially even leading to a lactate requirement, and maybe even you requiring additional blood pressure medications. The best way to classify sepsis, there's a lot of unique ways. Uh, the more popular and one of the older ways to do it is through the SERS criteria. And uh, oftentimes, SERS criteria is this four criteria, and you need to usually have at least two of them to meet criteria for SERS. So that usually means a white blood cell count less than four or greater than 12, a temperature above 38, but believe it or not, also below 36. 38 degrees Celsius is 100.4, and 36 Celsius, I believe, is around like 96 Fahrenheit. So uh, that is, those are the two criteria, a heart rate above 90 or a respiratory rate above 20 or a PCO2 less than 32. Um, but notice that you need to put this all in the right clinical context, right? Like if I just went for an, if I just had finished a run, my heart rate might be above 90 and my respiratory rate would be above 20. So in theory, I meet surge criteria, but I'm not going to be septic. So you need to put this in the context of a patient who is actually sick. And oftentimes, if a patient comes in with these numbers, they have a fever, they have a high heart rate, and they have a respiratory rate that's like 30, that actually makes me think I should get blood cultures on them. And that primarily is one of the biggest things, that's the biggest takeaways of this video. If someone looks sick enough, that usually is a good indication to get blood cultures. But guess what? Chances are, if someone has cellulitis or you're seeing someone in an outpatient setting, they're not going to have any of these four criteria. And so for you to get blood cultures, it's going to be really low stakes. But someone in the hospital who has a white, white count of 19, who's hypotensive, who is then tachycardic, uh, you might actually want to consider getting blood cultures because guess what? They already meet criteria for SIRS.
And so notice that severe sepsis is usually two plus of these criteria with a low blood pressure and an elevated lactic that is responsive to fluids. But if you have a elevated lactate that is not responsive to fluids, that would mean septic shock, right? And a shock is usually a pronounced state that requires um, pressors at times. Um, and then otherwise, meningitis is always something to consider and endocarditis is something to consider as well. Those would be other cases where you should get blood cultures. Endocarditis is obviously a infection of your uh, endometrium of your heart. And for that, you need blood cultures because quite literally there's blood in your heart. So if your heart's infected, your blood ultimately will get infected. And actually the type of organism that glows from the blood culture is very, very, very important for endocarditis. So with that being said, what is the prevalence of bacteremia? So we went over all of this. So you should really only get blood cultures when you have a high pretest probability. And oftentimes you're going to have a high pretest probability for someone who meets two of these four criteria, or you're concerned about meningitis, which is infection of the meninges, or you're concerned about endocarditis. Those are usually the four times you should definitely get blood cultures because they're going to impact your management and more importantly, going to impact your antibiotic choice. Because if something's going in your blood, you're going to need antibiotics against it. So notice here, the whole point is I wouldn't usually get blood cultures for someone with cellulitis unless they have septic, septic like criteria. I wouldn't get blood cultures for pneumonia. Sometimes I get blood cultures for pyelonephritis, especially if they're hypotensive or tachycardic or have high PCO2 levels. And of course, if they look septic at all, definitely get blood cultures. If they're febrile, if they're tachycardic, or if they're breathing pretty quickly. So all of this to say blood culture should never be ordered in isolation. They should be put in the clinical context for people. For low-risk patients, cultures are going to do more harm than good and never get them because they might grow something and now you might have to treat them for something that they don't actually have. But if you have a high clinical suspicion, I definitely would get blood cultures. Um, this actually happens a lot in the ED. And the re important part of this is that you're not just looking at these as like, oh, we want to do a thorough workup. Everything in healthcare costs money, right? So if you order blood cultures on someone who doesn't need them, one, you might be exposing them to antibiotics that they don't need. And two, it costs money, right? It costs money to do these cultures. It costs money to train them. It costs uh, laboratory personnel. It costs nurses um, who are actually going to draw those cultures. So to get cultures on people who don't need them is actually very detrimental um, to our overall healthcare system. Now, here's a very interesting note um, on sepsis from a urinary source. So most of the time when you have genital urinary infections, you're going to end up getting um, a urinalysis and a urine culture anyway. And that urine culture is going to ultimately guide your antibiotics. And even if the urine culture grows something, you often just treat for a seven to 14 day course anyway. And so you usually don't necessarily need to get blood cultures in someone who you think has a UTI because the urine culture will provide you more than enough information. But obviously if they get much, much worse and you think they're acutely septic or you think they maybe have endocarditis um, and maybe their urine is one of the end organ impacts, then, then it might be worthwhile. But ultimately for a urinary source, I wouldn't be too worried about getting blood cultures because you're going to get a UA and um, urine culture anyway. And you're going to probably treat for seven to 14 days uh, with antibiotics, which is going to more than cover any sort of bacteremia you have. And ultimately, this is the last point I was going to tell you about, which is the financial implications. So culturing patients can lead to false positives if your pretest probability is low. And then ultimately, that also leads to higher healthcare burden and healthcare costs. So that's why it's important to not culture everyone. But I'd say the biggest point of this video was to describe the fact that you should get blood cultures only when you have a high pretest probability. And here's the conditions when you have that. So please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.